Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is directional control valves. My objective is to introduce directional control valves and discuss their purpose, construction, and method of operation as applied to fluid power systems. A valve is a fluid power device designed to modify pressure, flow rate, or flow direction. A subset of these valves, those that modify flow direction, are appropriately called directional control valves. Directional control valves are designed to stop, start, and change direction of flow in a fluid power circuit. Which position a directional control valve assumes ultimately influences the actuation direction of a fluid power actuator. Directional control valves are best introduced using a progressive examination of the schematic symbols that make them up. We'll start out slow and increase the speed intensity as we go along. First, valves are ordinarily drawn schematically as boxes where each box is an independent position the valve can assume. Each valve position performs a particular function. Since this schematic symbol has two boxes, this valve is a two position valve. Ports or ways are the entry and exit points to a valve. This is a two position, two way valve. Different manufacturers and applications might use different labels. However, we'll just call these ports one and two. Internal to the position boxes, directional control valves use a range of symbols to represent selectively connected or disconnected ports. Arrows from one port to another means an open passageway is established between the two ports and fluid can flow. Unidirectional arrows mean flow is intended to be unidirectional, whereas bidirectional arrows mean flow can be bidirectional. A dead end T means that that port is not connected and no fluid can flow. Other symbols internal to the position boxes, like check valves and restrictions, exist. However, let's limit this introductory analysis to simply unidirectional and bidirectional arrows implying connection and dead end T's implying no connection. Once we examine the cutaway of a directional control valve, I'll come back and explain how check valves and flow control valves internal to a position box work. As previously discussed, each valve position performs a specific function. This position closes the path from one to two and fluid cannot flow. This position opens a bidirectional path from one to two through which fluid can flow. Shifting a valve from position to position is the act of moving internal components like poppets, sliding plates, or spools to selectively connect or disconnect ports via the internal passageways machined into the valve body. Repositioning the movable components is known as the act of actuating the valve. Actuation methods include, but are not limited to, manual levers, foot pedals, push buttons, mechanical linkages, thermostats, electrical solenoids, pressure pilot, or a combination of these methods, like a solenoid-initiated, pilot-actuated valve, as is commonly illustrated for poppet-style solenoid-operated directional control valves. I know this barrage of actuation methods and symbols may have hit you like a swarm of Africanized bees, but I find it helpful to divide these into two general families, manual and automatic. Manual methods like levers, pedals, and buttons all require a human operator to physically move the valve and the internal components into a new position. Automatic methods like mechanical linkages, thermostats, pressure pilots, and electrical solenoids don't necessarily require a human operator to physically move the valve into a new position, but do so automatically. I'll further simplify your task by winnowing down this swarm into a much more manageable load. Most of the content in this playlist uses manual levers and electrical solenoids. If you can remember just these two actuation methods, you'll do just fine. A manual lever operated valve requires an operator to physically push or pull the valve into a new position. A solenoid operated valve uses an electrical solenoid, a type of linear electrical actuator to physically push or pull the valve into a new position. We'll deal with some of the electrical characteristics of solenoid operated valves in later lectures. This particular valve is actuated by an electrical solenoid. The act of actuating a valve to a new position implies the valve had an initial deactivated position to begin with. Valves use return springs that either offset or center a valve to an initial deactivated position. This example valve is spring offset into the normally closed position such that the valve does not ordinarily conduct fluid. 
the electrical solenoid must be energized to push the valve into the open position for fluid to flow. The full description of this directional control valve is a two-position, two-way, solenoid-actuated, spring-offset, normally-closed directional control valve. Such a valve can be used to turn on or off or isolate sections of a larger fluid power system. In the absence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid flow is blocked. In the presence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid can flow. Consider a subtle modification of this valve and see if you can put your newfound knowledge of directional control valves to the test. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can determine the number of positions, the number of ways, the actuation method, and deactivated state of this directional control valve. This directional control valve is almost identical to our first example, with one major exception. It is also a two-position, two-way, solenoid-actuated directional control valve. However, it is spring offset into a normally open position. The behavior of this valve is fundamentally different than our first example. In the absence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid can flow. In the presence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid flow is blocked. Let a comparison of these two valves in a sample hydraulic circuit demonstrate that a misreading of the schematic symbol can have dire consequences. Consider these two directional control valves in a portion of a hydraulic circuit making use of an accumulator, a type of hydraulic energy storage device. I know we haven't discussed accumulators yet, but you can think of them as the hydraulic equivalent of a battery. Accumulators store pressurized fluid for the purposes of maintaining system pressure, absorbing shocks, compensating for thermal expansion and contraction, developing fluid flow and controlling noise. Accumulators can be a source of hazardous stored hydraulic energy even when the pump is de-energized. Note the directional control valve on the right, in its deactivated state, is spring offset to the open position. When the solenoid is de-energized, this directional control valve would dump the accumulator to tank. It only keeps the accumulator from bleeding down in its activated or opposite state. This type of directional control valve might be suitable for an application that removes the hazardous stored energy in the accumulator when the solenoid is depowered. In contrast, the directional control valve on the left, in its deactivated state, is spring offset to the closed position. When the solenoid is de-energized, the directional control valve keeps the accumulator from bleeding down, maintaining the stored energy. This one only dumps the accumulator to tank in its activated or opposite state. This directional control valve might be suitable for an application that needs to make use of the stored energy in the accumulator when the system undergoes an emergency shutdown. An example might be the hydraulic system used to pitch modern horizontal axis wind turbine blades into or out of the wind. An emergency shutdown requires the wind turbine spill wind and aerodynamically break the rotor. This type of directional control valve would allow the stored energy in the accumulator to be used for this purpose. A misreading of the schematic symbols can have life threatening consequences. The directional control valve on the right in its deactivated state dumps the accumulator. The directional control valve on the left in its deactivated state keeps the accumulator charged. Any technician assuming the system is okay to work on in its deactivated state runs the risk of being injured or killed by the stored hydraulic energy in the accumulator. It is for this reason that some automatically actuated directional control valves incorporate a means of manually overriding the valve's deactivated state. The schematic symbol for a manual override looks like a top hat laid on its side. In the absence of a pilot electrical signal or in the event of a damaged solenoid coil, an operator can push or pull the manual override to actuate the valve. The manual override on the normally closed valve would dump the pressurized fluid in the accumulator to tank. Manual overrides may or may not feature a detent that locks the valve in the new position. Let's again put your newfound knowledge of directional control valves to the test. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can determine the number of positions, the number of ways, the actuation method, and the deactivated state of this directional control valve. This is a two-position, three-way, manually actuated directional control valve spring offset to a deactivated position that blocks flow at three and allows bidirectional flow from one to two. In its activated state, 
and allows bidirectional flow from two to three and blocks flow at one. Given these arrows are bidirectional, consider a couple of the creative ways this valve can be put to use. Consider configuration of this valve, making use of port two as the pressure port, port one as the input to system A, and port two as the input to system B. We have in effect created a selector valve. In the deactivated state, pressurized flow is routed to system A. In the activated state, pressurized flow is routed to system B. Thus the valve is selecting which port and system receives pressurized flow. Note I've not included a pressure relief valve on the pump to keep this diagram simple. Two position, three-way directional control valves are commonly used to control the actuation direction of single acting cylinders. Consider configuration, making use of port one as the tank port, port two as the actuator port for a spring retracted, hydraulically extended single acting cylinder, and port three as the pressure port. The spring offset deactivated position blocks the pressure port while the actuator port is drained to tank, allowing the spring force to retract the rod. When the valve is actuated into the second position, pressurized flow is routed to the single acting cylinder and the cylinder extends. When operator releases the manual lever, return spring offsets the valve such that the spring force retracts the cylinder. Alternatively, consider a swapped configuration making use of port one as the pressurized port, port two as the actuator port for the same spring retracted, hydraulically extended single acting cylinder, and port three as the tank port. The spring offset deactivated position routes pressurized flow to the single acting cylinder and the cylinder extends. When the valve is actuated into the second position, the pressure port is blocked while the actuator port is drained to tank, allowing the spring force to retract the rod. When an operator releases the manual lever, return spring offsets the valve such that pressurized flow is routed to the single acting cylinder and the cylinder extends. Note these two different configurations using the same valve and the same actuator have essentially opposite functionality. The first one's deactivated state is a retracted cylinder that only extends when the operator manually actuates the valve. The second one's deactivated state is an extended cylinder that only retracts when the operator manually actuates the valve. Both these configurations need hydraulic pressure to extend the rod. However, their initial deactivated state is opposite because the valve has been configured differently. Since both these applications require hydraulic pressure to extend the cylinder, this really wouldn't be my actuator of choice for fail-safe braking applications. A loss of hydraulic pressure for either of these systems would not extend the cylinder and apply the brakes.